We're up here, man. We're, we're up here or down here in Tribeca. We're ready to do the second half with our uh, guest today. And uh, he's a lot of fun. He could actually be a stand-up comic, Bill. <laughs> he could. He's a funny Hornet, guy, man. He's Ed a funny Hornet, guy. Former deputy chief in the NYPD. Then went on to be a police commissioner in Yonkers. Before we get back we, we get back into our interview, we, we've we been like, you're such a great guy and so easy to talk to, Ed. And then uh, like half these stories that you start telling us, I'm like, shh, save it for the air. So well, I'm, I'm here for you, Mark. Yeah, <laughs> so I, we, you started on this story. Apparently, you were... Uh, in the intelligence division, you're the boss. Tell us the, the, what you were, you were just telling us, right? It's a great story. The intelligence division is a great command. And, and actually, later on, I'd like to maybe, in a serious note, talk about some of the post-9-11 stuff that the my guys in Intel did uh, and never got credit for it. And they weren't looking for credit or medals or anything like that. But after 9-11, obviously, it was a crazy time in the city, crazy time in the job. And these guys did the work of heroes that day and, and months afterwards and never fully was acknowledged. But anyway, get off the uh, somber note. Uh, Intel... For, again, those who don't know, the intelligence division at the time, and still to this day, they're in charge of dignitary protection. So they guard the mayor, they guard all the UN people and senators and everybody else that comes to town. So in this one occasion, the Yankees had won the World Series the year before. So uh, Commissioner Carrick at the time, Bernie Carrick, called me up and said, you know, we got to set up a motorcade from Baltimore and get him right into the White House to be honored So right by after President. they won the World Series, the it's next the, it's day? It's usually the next year. So oh, they, it's the next year, they okay. Won the, they, won, I guess they, they won in October of 2000, and they were getting honored by the President in probably May of 2001. So being a Yankee fan, it was great for me. I get to escort the team on buses right into the White House, right into the West Wing, in the Rose Garden, the whole bit. And uh, it was really, really, you know, a great, you know, kind of a highlight moment in my career. Uh, but, but as cops, we... We seek humor no matter where it happens. <laughs> That's so true. So uh, after being on this bus for an hour or two, uh, there's in the West Wing, there's a couple of little like one stall, two stall little bathrooms. Uh, so we all had to run to get on line. And so the uh, former Yankee great Lee Mazzilli, good guy, nice man, uh, very personable guy. He's on line with us. So guys are going in. The president's going to come out in minutes. Guys are going in and, you know, taking a leak. So again, being cops, you know, Lee goes first. And uh, apparently, somebody had gone in before him and absolutely destroyed this bathroom. In the, in the White House. It was a big number two, shall we say. Yes, in the West Wing. Uh, and there's no way Lee Mazzilli could have done it because he just went in and out real quick. But again, you, being a guy... Did you, you don't call want the to, hazardous materials unit? We had to, it, was, it, was a, it was a crime scene almost. Uh, Lee comes out, the poor guy, and he's devastated. He's embarrassed, and we're on line right behind him, and he's holding the door open going... I didn't do that. I didn't do Like, why does he care, right? But I didn't do that. And we both go, surely, sure. So the poor guy's like embarrassed as hell. But again, he's like I said. A, he's not a cop. He's not used to Even that. in the White House, yeah. you could find some humor. That's right. How was the White House? It was beautiful. I tell you, the Oval Office, we packed him in. Uh, George Steinbrenner was alive at the time. And he was actually taking over. And finally, the President of the United States says, uh, you know, George, just to remind you, I'm the president of the United States. Because <laughs> you know, they were former colleagues when, when Bush was one of the owners of the Texas Rangers. So they kind of knew each other. But typical George Steinbrenner, who I loved, uh, he was just taking over the whole room. You know, and wow. you know, the, the J, 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 GWB finally had to say, excuse me, it's my office, pal. Great. So you got the chance to get to know George Steinbrenner too, huh? No, a little just bumping into him. But uh, I know uh, guys that work for him. And listen, he's a, he's a tough guy, but he did so many humanitarian things for some of his employees. If he found out somebody's wife was sick... Uh, he dropped everything and made all kinds of phone calls. So, well, one of his executives wasn't he writing graffiti on the outside of Yankee Stadium and the, when he was a kid. So then jo the rumor has it. Well, the story goes, not the rumor. It's a true story. George Steinbrenner was was pulling in with his limo, whatever. Reached out, went out of the car, grabbed the kid. What the hell are you doing? Found out this kid's name, wh what his situation was, and got him a job working at Yankee Stadium. The guy rose up through the ranks until he was an executive. One of the biggest executives of the Yankees, yeah, a Puerto that's, Rican that's, kid from the Bronx. That's a, a lot of stories story, like that. Man. Yeah, yeah. That's a great story. He's a, he a good guy in his own way. Uh, you know, it's it's you know, there's a lot of stories out there floating around about him being a real good guy. Listen, I know he's a he's well, he used to master. fire his managers oh. often, and you know that was his thing, and he was always in the paper. Yeah. So, um, so that intelligence division was a, a good place to work, huh? It was a great place to work. It was good people. 
uh, now it's a bureau. Now they, they really, rightfully so, they beefed it up after 9-11. They do a lot more different things. They post guys in other countries now. Mm-hmm. So the, the Intelligence Bureau now does outstanding work. Did they but start doing that when you were in the CO? No, they started after 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 I left. Yeah, I knew some guys who were in London. You know, they were yeah. in Israel. That's pretty amazing. They always have right? a guy in London, They have to Israel. live there? Yeah. yeah. They do like a two or three year commitment. No, they take a train every day from Canarsie. That's what I said. That's t- that's a that's a big commute. They give them portal to portal. No, because these <laughs> yeah. guys complaining that they got to go pay a toll. That's yeah. right. They got to pay yeah. for a plane ticket yeah. every day. That's really getting launched. <laughs> that's right. yeah. Launched what to the London. <laughs> what the hell did you do? That's beyond that. You work in Israel. I, yeah. I just saw one of my rip guys. Damn, that guy stepped he just on. got be- he retired, but he was stationed in London. He goes, "It sucks there. It's fifteen bucks a beer." That's how he measured it. You know, I was like, "Wow, that's a lot of money." Then we give him the beer stipend. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot of money for. He's obviously drinking in the wrong place. No, but well, in London, right. everything's expensive as hell. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. You got to get out of London off the beaten path a little bit. I'm <laughs> sure there's places that it's not 15 They don't now. give it to your OTA in London. They don't care, man. Yeah, you got Detective Pat would probably pay yeah, in you London. Yeah, you got to tell them. Detective Pat in London. Oh, forget about you gotta it. Send you guys got any PBRs? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so you worked in a lot of interesting places. I was reading your resume. Bill made me. Um, he always makes me do this. The uh, movie's th- coming out. Soon. That's right. Yeah. I and sent so, it to Pam so and many, Rashad, too. I hope I'm going to quiz them later, so too. So many freaking good things here, man. Yeah. I don't want to embarrass you, but... Like, where, where were we? Um, police commissioner of Yonkers, obviously. Deputy chief of the NYPD. You worked with the FBI, the DEA, the Secret Service... I mean that's that's uh, that's a beautiful resume. And they all sent me to different schools and stuff like that. So yeah, I, I saw you know I saw that all the training you got. Then when you talk about a guy's balls dipped in butter, the training comes <laughs> in there too. Yeah, the you know? training. Yeah, the all training helps. Gets the FBI academy. Gets all this cushy stuff. No, because know? the training helps you get uh, other jobs. Even if it was getting a CDL license on the job, you get that training on the job, then you can drive a truck when you retire. It gives me. A, I'm I don't think test. he's driving yeah. a truck. No, though. but I'm just saying there's a lot of great training on the job. Yeah, there is. There I'm is. looking at my resume sometimes I'm like it says uh, he was a team player <laughs> he played ball there's a lot of ball playing in my <laughs> never be a shining star but he was a ball <laughs> it's a team he'll player. never jam you up <laughs> so that's not a bad resume right but you wouldn't mind having me as a they always, always buys his round is always that's a nice right. yeah 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 he doesn't go to the bathroom when the third round has been purchased makes, yeah. makes a good cup of coffee we talked about that upstairs uh we're getting coffee. You didn't trust your coffee coming. Because uh, when you're a big boss, right, what happens? You, everybody wants to bring you coffee. They want to do something. You were a big boss on the job. Everyone's kissing his ass. Yeah. yeah let's face uh, it, man. Right? I got my own coffee. Chief. You got your own coffee. I got my Chief, own coffee. Chief, can yeah. I start your car before you yeah. go out so I could turn the heat on? Well, you know, it's funny. It's, well, it's funny, but it's not funny. In Yonkers, Yonkers maybe every 15 years goes outside for a, for a police commissioner. So I don't know if you know Charlie Conley. Charlie Conley is also a friend and mentor to me. Charlie was the, Charlie's now 80-ish, but wow. Charlie was the PC in Yonkers in the 80s. Then in the mid-90s, they brought in a guy, Bob Olson, who I, I still stay in touch with a little bit. Bob Olson was like the chief in like Omaha, Nebraska, something wow. like that. So right away when he got there, the Yonkers cops called him Tex. <laughs> so he was Tex, even though he never was in Texas, but he was Tex. <laughs> right, right. But there was some craziness going on in Yonkers at the time, and there was a guy who was fired for some, or, or was, he was told to leave. He was going to be fired. He decided to resign. And whatever happened, there was a rumor that somebody affiliated with that guy was very upset about it uh, and had a, had a background in, in Vietnam and explosives and stuff like that. So long story short, Commissioner Olson comes out of his home, starts his car, and there was a hand grenade wired to a coffee Whoa. can. So the car blows up. Good, he got like burned on his leg and stuff like that. He actually stayed another year, but uh, oh, wow. so when people kid around about like you know, hey, when you went to Yonkers, uh, mm-hmm. did you give your car keys to your wife so she could start the car? And, uh, <laughs> but uh, well, for those of our listeners who aren't from New York, let's describe what what Yonkers is even is. Um, Yonkers is a little bit further north in the Bronx. Uh, that's where it actually begins. And um, why isn't it part of a? And why isn't it patrolled by the new NYPD? You know, Yonkers is the and How I big learned, is it? How big is Yonkers? Yonkers oh, it's Westchester. Yonkers is Westchester County. Yonkers is the fourth biggest city in New York State. And it's only... Uh, Rochester, for some reason, always comes in a few thousand people more. 
than Yonkers. And I always, when I would deal with my colleagues in Rochester, I said, you're counting dead people up there, aren't you? <laughs> because Yonkers is way bigger, I think, than Rochester. But anyway, it's a separate yeah, city. Yeah, but Rochester, itself. you're talking about something way further north. Yeah, way up in western New York. So Yonkers has its own identity. They really get ticked off when people think it's the Bronx mm -hmm. or it's a sixth borough or when people that don't know the city at all say, so, so, so that's in New York City, right? It's not, and they're very, they're very sensitive about that, mm -hmm. and rightfully so. It's, it's, it's. it's got what, its what did they call you when you went to Yonkers? They called the other guy Tex. What they call you? Well, to my face, they said Kamish, <laughs> but I don't know. Uh, I used to sign everything E H, so it's uh, like E H. Or when they were pissed at me, it was that F and E H. You know. So, but uh, <laughs> how many cops on that department? I had uh, 650 sworn cops, which by national standards is a very big police department. Mm -hmm. By the time I left, we're down with budget cuts and stuff. We're down to about 600. But uh, I'll say right up front, it was, it was a great experience for me, not to be self-serving or blow smoke, but uh, the five years I spent in Yonkers was one of the highlights of my career. Uh, good street cops, great detectives, great they have emergency a narcotics guys. division there. They have right? a small narcotics unit. Uh, used to, I know somebody that worked in there. Very, they're, cool, they're, very good person. It's a, it's pretty much other than like a bomb squad and stuff like that. It's pretty much self sufficient. It's big enough to be self sufficient. Uh, and I'll tell you one thing: anytime there's there's a test given or cops, I never had a cop roll out of Yonkers to another department. Right. It, they always roll into Yonkers because everyone's making five hundred hours a year well, overtime there's, in there's, Yonkers. There's yeah, what is the salary <laughs> over there? It's a, they do a bit better base salary than, than New York City. No, that's they, not, everybody does better in New York. Uh, I don't know. Much better. Is it Nassau that's Suffolk? Disgraceful, right? It's it's not Nassau Suffolk. No. And it's not Clarkstown, Orange Town like like in Rockland County, but it's they do well and mm. they're they still make overtime. The overtime is sometimes a little out of control, but but the, they still do pretty well. They mm -hmm. still do you pretty know, well. You know, let me ask because culturally I know on the NYPD they're really proud of them cutting back overtime. How come you couldn't cut overtime in Yonkers? Well I did. You I did cut it. I didn't. I didn't get crazy. Like you know, they would complain. Like you know, hey, you're bringing the NYPD playbook here, and I said, well, it's a good playbook, but I don't bring everything from the NYPD. Right, just the right. stuff that works. Right. I mean, I I used to say our patrol guy, the NYPD, is this thick mm -hmm. because of all the mistakes and tragedies that we've had. You know, so, uh, but but by and large, it's a good playbook, especially when you throw in all the stuff that Bratton brought in with Comstat, et cetera. Did so, you bring Comstat? To I did. I did. But I did it in a more, Wait, I think, a more collegial their, way. Their police academy, what are they, combining with the other Westchester counties? Well, Westchester does the academy, mm -hmm. and then Yonkers sends their guys there. And then they get two weeks with, you know, my training guys. Why doesn't New York just go up there and just take over Yonkers? <laughs> We could run. We can run them right over. I don't know, man. When the people, Yonkers guys are pretty when, tough. When people in Yonkers watch this, they're gonna be like, "Who is that fucking guy?" I, I tell you, we should just take it over. Yeah, they better, they better come. Them, they better right. come ready to fight if they're gonna do that. Hotnet was the plan. <laughs> What's the other area over there? Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon is part of Yonkers. Or no, no, Mount Vernon's no, a separate no. city. Mount Vernon has all kinds of problems. Oh, they got bigger you know, problems. Big than problems. Yeah. The politics there are crazy. They're, you know, they're. Elected officials there. Are That's how we'll do it. Terrible. Oh my God. We'll take over Mount Vernon, and then we'll have you on both sides. And then we can just walk <laughs> right through Make Adam own the police commission. I've been watching, Mount I've been watching the, the World War II Netflix documentary. I think you're watching Game of Thrones or something. The, it's you a, have you seen Kingdoms. that, the World War II uh, documentary? No, not yet. Oh, man, you got to see it. It's a, it's unbelievable. But uh, that's that's what, you know you're watching how they actually the Germans went about the Second World War and why they got England started getting involved because they started taking over all these lands that they used to have, but slowly methodically building up. I think the NYP should do that. Fuck that, man. Let's go take Yonkers, man. Let's take it right over. Let's you're gonna have a fight Yonkers. on your hands. Trust me. <laughs> Yonkers guys don't mess around. So what like what's the difference between being a chief now and being the actual commissioner? Well, you know when I was the. How many chiefs did you have under you as, as, as the commissioner? Uh, I had three. But when I was in NYPD, I was my last command in NYPD, I was the second in command of the narcotics division for the entire city. And the CO, the commanding officer, was my friend, just recently retired, Jim O'Neill. Okay. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. So Jimmy and I got along very well. Good guy. So the Yonkers thing kind of pops up. And a guy I know that's involved with the city of Yonkers at the time, he calls me up and he says, hey, the, the mayor's looking uh, to switch out the police commissioner. So he's calling me. And I said... I'll see if I can find someone. Oh, my God. And wow, he says, no, so knucklehead. He wants to talk to you. Oh, wow. So wow. I said, okay. So, you know, I had a casual conversation. Then it, it became more like a reality where he said they were going to offer me the job. So it's funny. When you're at that rank, when you're a deputy chief or even lower than that, protocol requires – it's not written down anywhere, but protocol requires you have to tell the police commissioner that you're leaving, that, you go, that you're looking at another job you're leaving. You, you don't want him to find out about that on the street. So uh, I made an appointment to see uh, Commissioner Kelly at the time, and uh, he's very gracious. Uh, he wished me well. And uh, actually, you know, I had to actually get approved by the city council. So I took the job without city council approval, which was a bit of a risk. And uh, to his You're credit, talking about the Yonkers PD, to, obviously, right? I took the Yonkers job, and uh, 
to his credit, uh, Ray Kelly, un, unsolicited, wrote a letter. Somebody said he must have been really trying to get rid of me. Uh, <laughs> he wrote a letter on my behalf saying, the city council, I fully endorse, you know, Ed Hartnett as the next police commissioner. So it was really kind of him to do that. I actually put that on a wood plaque just so I could show it to people. Wow, but, man. That but is it was, really, it's an amazing career that you had. To be police police commissioner and uh, and again mentors like I asked guys like I said man I'm happy doing what I'm doing I, I don't want to take that that's a crazy job and I wasn't sure if I was ready for it and then like John Timoney Pat Harnett other people said you got to go run your own police department they all did it and they said you could do it too so that gave me the confidence to to take mm -hmm. the job and I went in by myself you know I didn't have a luxury of bringing friends and mentors and other guys in with me what kind of problems did you have in Yonkers as compared to New York City well. When I got to Yonkers, Yonkers, again, they're great street cops. They were uh, maybe a little rough around the edges in the street. Uh, there was a lot of uh, backlash coming from the community about, uh, you know, that they weren't treating people respectfully, especially in, in communities of color. And I got to say, uh, those stories were not all fabricated. I could see that there was an edginess. There was, a, there was an, an attitude maybe in some neighborhoods where that they weren't uh, treating folks in those neighborhoods the same as they're treating other neighborhoods. So... We got down to business, and I we told people what can what I expect of them, what we expect of them, and what won't be tolerated. And uh, you know, I had to discipline some folks and get them to understand that you know policing now in the twenty first century uh, requires that we have it a little more tact and a little more sensitivity, shall we say? Uh, and listen, they came around; they're good cops, so the they know. Yonkers have the uh, body cams. I think they might be getting some of them now, maybe uh -huh. on a pilot. You got the raceway over there, right? I'm trying to think of uh, things that happen in Yonkers, you know, like that could be comparable to the city, like, you know. Uh, the raceway is now a casino, too. So it's been yeah. a casino for years. So uh, that really that, didn't generate much problems. So. But I'm just, oh, okay. But it, that is in Yonkers, though, right? Yeah. Yonkers has four precincts, and, and it's, it's almost like four separate towns. Like, Northeast Yonkers is like the suburbs, it, it borders Scarsdale, Bronxville. You know, East Chester, it's, it's very nice. Low crime. Uh, Southwest Yonkers, parts of it look like parts of the Bronx. It's, yeah. And it's got all the social ills, you know, drugs, gangs, violence. Uh, and then the other two precincts are a little bit of a mix. Uh, but I tell you, like I said, it was a great experience. Uh, I think Jada, Jada Kiss, the rappers from Yonkers, all the Yonkers. He is, one of what? them is uh, Jada Kiss or DMX. He gets stopped DMX every now and then. DMX too, right? Uh, the, yeah. And he does, you know what? And, and one of them, I forget which one. All the cops know he does not have a valid driver's license. Who? One of these guys. One of them. I get him mixed up. And he drives down Yonkers all the time because he wants to get stopped. <laughs> because, because I he think record to, sales go up. He wants some street cred. It's yeah. got to be DMX. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think it's DMX. Yeah. It and, has uh, to be. The guys stop him and he's like, yeah, no, yeah, you know I don't have a driver's license. And it's and it makes the papers the next day. But uh, it's a fun, it was a fun <laughs> place to work. How many homicides would you get a year there? Not that many. I tell you what. They was, they'd never get into double figures. Really? Ba barely. Barely. And uh, the detective, when they did have a homicide, they got solved. They had a great clearance rate. Uh, they knew people in the street. They had good informants. I, I tell you, they were, I, I'd stack the, the best Yonkers detectives and the best Yonkers detective bosses, I would stack up with the guys I met in NYPD. They're that good. Uh, and same thing with street crime guys. I had great street crime guys that were good, you know, good in the street, could make a collar, could make, could make the case, you know, right. not just indiscriminately tossing everybody. Uh, the emergency service guys up there are outstanding. I got them some equipment. I got them their own building. So, uh, you know, maybe some of the Yankees guys may not like me, but the ESU guys like me they a lot. Like like, I got, did, I got did them you some have new digs. A, a black smoked out SUV that was driving you around and your own driver and all this stuff like that? No, no. I had, a, I had a, uh, an SUV. If I didn't know where I was going, I'd how, bring a guy uh, with um, me. I don't mean to cut you up. How, how hot was your driver? I mean, what? Give it. Tell us what she looked like, and break it down for us. <laughs> he, listen, he, he's probably listening right now. He was a he was a big, ugly bagpiper. Oh so, my uh, God! Sorry, Pat. Was but he that's practicing it, man. in the car? No, 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 no. He didn't bring his chanter with him. No, no. But uh, no, no hot driver. Pat, you're not hot. I'm sorry, bro. <laughs> yeah, man. That's that's some on. I mean, Police commission. I, I used to work in the building uh, at 300 Gold Street. That's where um, you worked. I, I read that you were also the CEO of Quality Insurance. Quality Insurance, yeah. Oh, Which was an interesting unit, job, right? to say the least. It was. It's a kind of job where I got called in. I was a precinct commander, and I got heard a rumor that I was being moved. And when you're a precinct commander, when you're being moved, you'd be moved to another precinct usually. I said, okay, you know, I got promoted. I'll go to another precinct, hopefully get promoted there. You get called down. And back then, the culture was, if you're getting good news... You went to see the police commissioner. It was Howard Safer at the time. If you're getting bad news, you're going to see the first deputy commissioner, who's Pat Keller at the time. So I'm, I'm being told to see 
the police commissioner, so it's good news of some kind. So the commissioner calls me in, and he talks to me for a while. Nice guy. And uh, he tells me, and, and you've been selected by Commissioner Kelleher because QAD <laughs> reported to him at the time. I said, Kelleher? <laughs> and he says, uh, you've been selected by Commissioner Kelleher to be the CEO of the Quality Assurance Division. Who and you have to say, you can't say, no, I don't want it. You're not allowed to. Inspections. It's I know, inspections. but it's just like. And like, like I always say, like, you never met a little kid, like when you're five years old. What do you want to be? I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a fireman. No little kid ever said, I want to be the CEO of the Quality Assurance oh, Division. No so <laughs> it's not that kind of job, but I'll tell you what, I, I well, went there for a year do, and a half. They go to the precincts and go over their books. Everything. They look so at everything. So they're not everything. looking at really at the cops so much. They're looking at uh, all the, all, what, the, the interim log. Um, the paperwork, 61s, overtime. 28s, Every, overtime. Everything, gas pumps, everything. And, and, and they also look at anything that the NYPD purchases. So helicopters, cars, refrigerators, everything gets looked at yeah, by like, somebody quality to, assurance to, division. To throw something out, you got to fill out like 10 pages of paperwork, right? It's it's amazing it's, place. It's ridiculous. But, but the biggest thing they do, I think, is they look at the quality and accuracy of the crime reports, the 61s mm -hmm. as we yeah. call them. Uh, and, and sadly, I know some of the guys too. Sadly, there's guys that, you know, they cook the books. They would lie about their crime stats. You <gasps> had to have something. Why would anybody do that? <laughs> well, they always say there's two reasons. They lied about it because they were afraid of comp stat. But I think more so they lied about it because they wanted to get promoted. Right. And uh, sadly, we caught a couple of guys who had a complete uh, administrative crime reduction. Like, outside the door, crime was really up. But inside, when it got to his it desk, down. crime went down. So. Yeah. It's an important function, but thankfully I did a year and a half there and I moved on you know, to... I, I saw some shit like that. We had we, One time we did this in the 2-3. I won't tell you who the CEO was. We had a guy machete like nine people. I, I almost cut arms off, caught off limbs. At the end of it, um, one of them got ro ro robbed by someone who wasn't involved in this. So what do you think he did? Menacing. No, he made it a robbery. <laughs> made one robbery. number. One oh, number. Instead, yeah. of nine Instead of nine assaults. assaults. Yeah, yeah, right. And the, the CEO who came after that guy caught him. He was like, this motherfucker. Oh. And he called the guy up because you piece of shit. Oh, oh no. And the rip, the rip detective spent hours in the office with him saying, Captain or Inspector, I know what you're trying to do. He goes, you're full of shit. And, this, and, he, oh, and the guy s tried to convince him. He goes, look, do whatever you, you're the commanding or Do whatever you want to do. He goes, I'm telling you, you're a liar. And, you're, and the guy... And she got caught by the next. Oh, yeah. There's a couple of precincts in, in Midtown area. Where you get a lot of tourists. And in one place in particular, I remember after my time, you know, like tourists from Germany gets robbed. And uh, well, when are you going back to Germany? I'm going back to Germany tomorrow. Thank you. Shit can the report. Yeah. yeah. So, exactly. So you, stuff like that has to be monitored. So, you know, like I said, it was a thankless job at times. But and I would I would have arguments with friends of mine who were precinct commanders. Like, Eddie, come on, man. That's not a burglary. It's not a burglary. And I was like, my man. The guy doesn't live there. He's in this person's closet when they come home, and he's naked. <laughs> so what's he doing? Right, he, had, right. he, had, he had evil intent of some kind, you know. So uh, well, they would call stuff like that were burglars. They call it lost property, right? They go trespass, lost property, yeah. double parking, whatever, yeah, whatever. Yeah, Tried to get out of it, insane. but uh, but it was a crazy place to work. But uh, it, it's you know what? How it long served me well there? later. I, I used I to work on the same floor. I'll tell you, man, you had some crack team of detectives working up there, and sergeants. They weren't detectives, oh, they listen, were sergeants. Listen, they, they were great people. No, they were good people. I you're not going to share I, a foxhole with most of them. No, but, uh, there was this one dickhead that used to come to the squad, and he, he was a sergeant. He's a piece of shit. He never, <laughs> he never did detective work but in his tell, life. Tell us how you feel, though. Yeah, he was a fucking piece of shit, this guy. <laughs> and he came in, and he was busting them. And for a couple of times, people were like, listen, you're a piece of shit. Uh -huh. You never even did this work. Uh -huh. Hey, don't talk. Get the fuck out of here. But you had to... You have to uh, play the game because yeah. he, he could destroy your command. It's so you know? weird, like, when they come to your command, too, because, you know, they, uh, they usually come unannounced, and then they're, they're making your PA crazy because, you know, she's the one that knows where all the 61s are. Yeah, you got to give everything to all, them. Where all the, <laughs> the stuff is buried, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all the bodies yeah, yeah. are buried. Yeah. <laughs> and she's like, he's got a list of cases he wants to right, look right. at. You know what I'm saying? And she's like, oh, man, we, we got to. <laughs> they're looking up, you know, drop ceilings for my cases. That's why I used to store mine. <laughs> So my sergeant, you know, he couldn't get at him when I was... That was, was before the DD-5 system. Then you were had. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, you yeah, had, but you were had. Yeah, poor Mamie. I told you the story about the detective from the 2-3. He's coming in from Long Beach, Long Island with this other detective, and they're an hour and a half late, and inspections is there, you know? And right away, they see they wanted his cases because he was like 70 in the hole. Yeah, that was cases. me. So he walks in, and he sees inspections, and he fucking turns white, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, Charlie... 
they want to see your case. <laughs> and he's there like this with the type of... He should have grabbed his chest. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. St. Luke's. Take me yeah. to St. Luke's. Yeah. It, but it was funny as hell when he saw them there. He was like, oh, no. <laughs> time is up, man. Yeah. That's time is up. That's when they. That's when you're, you're walking out of your office where you used to work with everything that was in your desk. <laughs> yeah. Like, hey, take care. Take yeah. care, Ed. Good you to lost, see you. Lost, it was a coffee cup. With you. <laughs> Keep in touch. I, I used to say to him, the kid would come in and he'd say, Detective. I'm little Johnny Lopez. You yeah. had me as a missing case seven years ago, and he pulled pull out the folder. <laughs> You're right. You yeah. Why didn't you look for me? Turned up. Yeah. Finally turned up. That's I right. can close this out now. That's right. <laughs> Found. <laughs> Did you do any investigation at all? Put it for an EPD after that. Uh, right. I was I was held in a basement by some old man for years. <laughs> why didn't you look for me? <laughs> yeah, that was that. Being the boss of that must. Were you in Three Hundred Gold Street too? Yeah. Oh, that's why you look familiar to me. I used to ride the elevator and work out in the gym upstairs with uh, with O'Neill all the time. It's a shame what happened with the whole Pantaleo thing, man. I think it was uh, something that, you know, it, the whole thing is just as a tragedy all the way around. All the way around. All the way from both sides. Obviously, from the Garner family. Um, from from what happened to this poor guy Pantaleo now, and then like even the ramifications of how to deal with it afterwards, I don't think he's. Uh, hopefully, he's going to be okay. Uh, you know, O'Neill, uh, you know, because uh, he seemed like a real gentleman to me. And then all the fallout after all of it is just it's disgusting. You know, yeah. Let's, if I may, if Jim O'Neill doesn't need me to defend him, but. Jim O'Neill's an honorable guy. Jim O'Neill doesn't like cops. He loves cops. Yeah, that's. I and had the feeling have, of that too. This must have broke his heart. I didn't talk to yeah. Jimmy about it, but listen, whether I agree or disagree with this decision, one thing I do know, I in my heart of hearts, I think Jimmy made that decision because he thought it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, I think, because he had any kind of political considerations or anybody you know, pressuring him. I think he, I know a lot of people disagree with me, but I think he just thought it was the right thing to do. And uh, he didn't want that to be part of his legacy, but he just thought it's the right thing to but, do. But you know, heart. Ed, let me ask some. How do you work with one of these progressive mayors? How can you do it? And when he, when he flies in the face of everything we learned as cops. It's got to be tough. you had to work with the mayor in Yonkers. Yonkers mayor was a great man. Uh, the guy, never, the Yonkers mayor, Phil Amaconi, a great man. He brought me in, didn't know me that well. And at the end, when he said he was, he couldn't run again because he was term limited. And he could have had term limits overturned. He wouldn't do it. He's too honorable a guy. So uh, I said, I'm leaving with you. I mean, the new guy coming in is not going to keep me anyway. But they wanted to interview me. It was all a sham. But uh, I left with him. And the guy never asked me. If I was, he's a Republican, I, he never asked me Republican, Democrat. I'm an independent. I'm not either one. He never asked me to, to hurt I'm an Irish. enemy. I'm Irish. Yeah, he never asked me to hurt an enemy. never asked me to yeah. help a friend. He just said, run the police department. That's all I need you to do. Mm -hmm. So he's a great man. But like in, in what, to get back to your question, Bill, whether guys like Giuliani or not, you knew that like there was a mayor that supported the police department. Right. And right now, I don't think the cops in the street, I know the cops in the street, my son included probably, they don't think that the mayor cares about them or has their back. So I think what's going on now in the police, even with the historic reductions that are still happening in many ways, it's it's in spite of the mayor, right, not because of the right, mayor. Right. Like the precision policing they're doing now, the targeted enforcement stuff, it's working for now. Well, look, the blueprint was written by Bratton mm -hmm. and the the forebearers of this, yeah. and they just got to keep following that blueprint you know what? and tweak of, it once in a while. Yeah. Speaking of future police work, I was reading some more about you um, that, that resume, but did I mention how beautiful that resume was? <laughs> Rap I put Technologies. It to, I put it to music. Um, you're a consultant there? I am. I am, yes. And it specializes in innovative, non-lethal technology to assist law enforcement officers in violent encounters. And I'm always fascinated by this stuff. Is there anything groundbreaking coming out that we can look forward to I that, think, that can I help us with the job? I think this is one of... This thing, they have a product called Bowler Wrap. I've done some oh, demos. Oh, yeah, I love that. Bowler Wrap is a great product. It's, it's like it's, from Planet of the Apes. It's, is, it's, that, it's, is that shooting the net at the guy? Well, it's, yeah, like yeah. A, it's like... It's more like... Like a, it's a, it's a long piece of uh, like t rope, almost like fishing line, but stronger with little barbs on the end, and it's it's a step below taser. One thing I like about this product is, listen, taser is a great product. I brought tasers to Yonkers. Taser is a great product, but all these things, whether it's the taser or beanbag gun or nightstick or mace, every one of those products depends on some kind of inflicting of pain yeah. to get compliance. This product. And it's more for like, you know, emotionally disturbed persons and unco It's not like every rest situation you want to wrap somebody. But if you have a, an emotionally disturbed person acting up in a room or in a courtyard or a street like that, 
you can deploy this thing and it makes a noise. It's, it's, a, it's a modified 380 caliber charge in it. So it makes a loud noise, which is a little distracting. And then it either wraps up his arms, or wraps up his legs, mm -hmm. and then you rush him. So it's, it's actually working in parts of the country now. It's, it's the in reason about why I departments. think it's not getting that much, I think people, is there a fear that it's going to go around somebody's head or their neck? It's, it's, it can't strangle anybody. It's not okay, strong good. enough to strangle. See, so why, what, what is, why is this not coming to New York? Some, some, some departments are a little concerned about the noise because if you, if you deploy, you hear the noise, some cops might think somebody's shooting and they might start shooting. And there's no way to like make a and noise reduction out of it? They're, they're working on a, on a, a modified You can put a potato model. on it on the end of it? Like, <laughs> but, like a modified silence? What I got to tell you, if you get a chance, go to the website or the, the video. The video is awesome. I've seen it, man. I've seen it. I've seen video on it and I'm thinking to myself, like you said, it, it it's not hurting the person. It just wraps around their torso, securing their arms to their body, or around their legs, so they can't run, flee, fight back. It's to me, it's it's a, it's it's beautiful. You know I what think. I always say in when you're when you're a police chief, there's always somebody calling you to to sell you stuff. Yeah. And I used to have a guy, former Fed, and I get along very well with the Feds, but this guy was like a snake oil salesman, and every like six months he would call. With some kind of you know super electronic dental floss or some crap, <laughs> uh, and and I'm like no man, because I, I would say like listen, it's got to be good, it's got to be good for my department, got to be good, got to help the men and women in the street, and the community's got to like it. And you check off those boxes, I'm going to listen. So when you're when you're a police chief, people want you to, want you to buy stuff from them. Uh -huh. When you're a former police chief, I get calls now of people want me to help them sell stuff, endorse the endorse. stuff. So yeah. I always say like I can't put my I listen I I. Spent 32 years building up a pretty good reputation. I can't attach my name to some BS product right. that I don't believe in. I, I met with these people. I saw what it does. Then I thought about myself being a young captain or a young sergeant mm -hmm. out in the street trying to subdue an EDP. And what happens? It's in Yonkers. I was getting guys hurt. Sometimes a dozen cops would get hurt trying to subdue some the EDP, third yeah. person. So they're in the hospital. He's in the hospital. Now I'm getting complaints. Hey, I called you up and, and you came and beat up my son. Uh, this is a product that in some cases works where you don't have to beat anybody up. Mm -hmm. You get them all wrapped up, then you rush them, you put them on the ground, it's over. You so know. I attach my name to something like this, and there's a couple other products I attach my name to, that something like this that I think tech checks those boxes for me. The Kilkenny Shillelagh. Yeah. <laughs> that one I like. That one, that one works in Kilkenny, yeah, but uh, not over here. How much space, well, well, how would you carry that thing? It's, it, looks almost like a, it looks almost like a taser. It looks like a, like a big garage door opener. Mm -hmm. And it's got a charge in the front. It looks almost like a flashlight, like a flattened out flashlight. Uh, it then comes out like I've I've watched the demo many times. You can't see it. It comes out that it comes out like six hundred fifty feet a second. Wow! You can stand up on the side. You need about ten feet or more, so you don't have to get that close to the guy either. Because like with the taser, even sometimes you got to get close. Mm -hmm. That guy could hurt you. This thing, you're ten to twenty feet away. It comes out fast. It goes around and it wraps. If it goes around the head, it's not gonna it's not gonna strangle him. So you get him. The legs are great. Maybe by the wrists. And sometimes you double, you have two guys, boom, boom, he's not going anywhere. And he could eventually get out of it, but that time you rush in with him and you stop he's everything. Handcuffed him, yeah. So people aren't getting hurt. You know, there's a great uh, the use of it recently in Fresno, California, where it was perfect. And that's, and that's what it's designed for. Not Listen, like anything, it's not perfect. Nightstick's not perfect. Chase is certainly you not know, perfect. That, that is definitely one of the biggest problems that police have is that the use of force, it never looks good. It never looks, and everything's videotaped now. It's a great so, point, Bill. Right, something like that will you know save them from like we're not using force with just. Well, you know what the problem too is a lot of this stuff. If it's really effective, you're going to have groups like the ACLU. They're going to fight it. All they wanted was the cameras. They just want all the police officers with cameras. Uh, so then this way, you know, there's going to be a record. Now the cameras are no good because the police officers supposedly can look at what happened and then they can put it on their report. It, it's if we got the tape, we're only gonna look. We're never gonna look at your stupid report again because your report is ne it's not gonna tell us more than what's on the tape. Yeah, I became you know what I became a convert to body cameras because I did consulting with with Bill Bratton. I did consulting in Detroit and Baltimore, Oakland, places where they had cameras. But what they did, they did was those places have consent decrees, so they rushed in these cameras. So for cameras to work right, you gotta have good equipment, you gotta have good policy to go with it, and good training. If you don't have each of those three things. The camera system's gonna fail. And then I, like, I, I guess, first of all, I was like, wow, man, cameras, I wouldn't wanna work with a camera. But you know what? Now I see cameras, 
Because you get the whole story with a camera. Yeah. You don't get the 10 second YouTube thing that somebody wants to make the cops look bad. You get the whole story now. And you see the, exactly what happened that led this incident to take well, place. Well, that's why they want to get rid of They want, they're saying it's because the officer has an opportunity to change his report. Well, the only reason why we'd look at the report is to jam up the cop instead of looking at what, the, what led the cop to want to arrest this criminal. We don't need yeah. the report anymore, it's all in the video. And also, it 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 uh, it keeps you know. Listen, we all know there's some cops out there that maybe misbehave. It keeps a guy keeps him honest. A, a little bit lined. Yeah. He he knows he's being recorded now. And I got to tell you, it also it also gives the public a really good idea of what these cops go through, like oh, how, how hard it is to subdue. Well, that's another problem. How hard is it to subdue and let me tell somebody you something. that doesn't want to be subdued? If you have a bad cop or or somebody who's videotaping in their car on their own, or you know just a civilian trying to record the cop. People forget they're on camera in 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. The real you is going to come out in 10 to 15 seconds. You're going to be nice in the beginning. I got a camera. I got a camera. I can't. Hey, fuck you. You know what I'm saying? You're just not even going to care. That's the way but it you is. Know something? Sometimes how you use your voice helps. Mm -hmm. And if someone has a problem with you saying, put your fucking hands down, they have a problem with yeah. it. But that could help save your life, too. Like, like you have a great detective supervisor background. And and I, I know it's 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 now become standard that the interviews all get recorded right away. Yeah. And you know what? And it, I, it's a good thing. But but you know yourself, some detectives have a certain style. They're not beating anybody up. Right. But some guys like to yell a bit. Some guys like to scream. Other guys are very subdued. That's mm -hmm. their style. Right. They get the confession. The guy that yells and screams and waves his arms, he gets a confession too. Yeah. But now when you see that on video, you, like you go, it. oh, yeah, that's yeah. intimidating. You know what? He's may be just as effective as that other guy, but you know, different paths to the same goal. A yes. real great detective is going to know they're going to have a, a couple of different interview um, uh, ways that they interview. And for some person, and usually it's uh, like, I'll tell you if, you, if you have somebody that comes from a certain country where the police are authoritative, probably abusive, that's what they learn. So if you're talking to them like, hello, and how are you? I'm sorry to disturb you. They're going to run roughshod right over you. Right, right. They want, they, that's the only way they're going to talk to you is if you're a little bit more aggressive. And if you're a good detective, that's the strategy you're going to use to talk to this person. If you see that somebody else is going to require a more, uh, you know, you know uh, uh, an easier go about it, you're not going to yell at them. It's not necessary. You use those, you have all those tricks in, in your bag. It's like acting in a way. Yeah. How am I going to get the confession out, out of this guy? You're going to, sometimes in one interview, in one interrogation, you might try two or three different tactics. You might try two or three different detectives, and each one has their own tactics just to see which one works. Yeah, and I think, the, the, again, it's a good thing in many ways, but I think the recording of the interview is sometimes a detective is now inhibited from doing his normal style. Some guys I right, know right. would like to like put a hand on a guy and you know kind of console him. Now it's like, I mean, you know, right. I'm going to this guy's going to think I'm well, forcing about, him. It's not going to look right. Even reading Miranda right at Jump Street, that used to never be done. Mm -hmm. You would schmooze the guy a little bit, get him comfortable, get him coffee, get him something to drink, mm -hmm. and then you'd present Miranda. Yeah. Now they want you to present Miranda immediately. Yeah. That's a little tough. Which I wonder, could, this, is there statistics on or that? Why, no, is I, the, why is the I detective sitting them. so close? Because that's that's a tactic that you learn if you go to investigate. If you go to like um, uh, training we talked about and learning how to do interrogations, one of the tactics is to, to get close sitting. So we're talking like this. Another tactic is to mimic your body language. You know, you right. see the way somebody sits. If they're leaning back, you lean back. If they're sitting up, you, you copy them. You mimic them. It makes them feel more comfortable psychologically. Sure. But one of the tactics of sitting so close, now you have a defensive. Why is he sitting so close? It's intimidating. It's right in his face. My, my client felt uncomfortable, he said. You know, um, and, and all these things sound that because they're... Well, you always recorded, had to be cognizant of not putting too many people in the room. Mm -hmm. I never wanted more than two detectives interviewing a guy because you put a third in there and then the defense attorney goes there's three detectives in oh, intimidating yeah. the shit yeah, out of yeah, my yeah. client you know so that's really interesting with the camera the body cameras and, and um any other ones besides that uh that bolo thing i love that bolo thing, i'm with the the, i'm with the company also they do uh i guess for want of a better term in layman's terms they do electronic blueprints uh where no more do you need to have the floor plans of a building or a complex or a stadium or a hospital or a college campus or a school 
uh, in folders and binders and written down somewhere. This is all on tablets, and, and uh, it's really taken off across the country. I think there's, there's several hundred school systems in New Jersey right now that have this product. It's called CRG, Collaborative Response Graphics, CRG Plan. And that's good for, company. like, active shooters. You have active the, shooter. Uh, it's even good for, like, daily, you know, operational stuff. But for active shooter now, if something bad goes on in a building, say a school, for example, if the, if the school system has this product, and again, it's one of the places that, one of the products that I'm happy to attach my name to, uh, they go there now, the first round of responders immediately, it get, gets activated, they know everything about the building right now. They know where every entrance is, every exit is, every right. gas pipe, mm -hmm. every, every fire extinguisher, everything in the place is mapped out. And uh, this thing is, I mean, Bowler you know, Rats do well. This thing is like really sweeping happy the country. They're really to get, uh, get their hands on this electronic blueprint thing. Burglars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know well, Can I would, we I would bring it here, but you guys put a head over my, <laughs> yeah, a, a yeah. hood over my head. When I got, I don't know where this address is. Hello, so, uh, Ed Hardnett. I'm a burglar. Can yeah. I order one of these? No, that's, uh, <laughs> you didn't like the way we met you on the corner in three in the van. Yeah. <laughs> but, Get but, in. But again, CRGs. Again, they have a website also. CRGs is it's it's actually sweeping the country. Is, sh is Shot Spotter like old hat now? Shot Spotter, no. Shot Spotter is good. We What's had Shot that? Spotter in Yonkers too. It's a, an acoustic gun detection system. Detection system where once a shot goes off, it's a triangulation of these devices that that pinpoint where the shot actually happened. Yeah, it's oh, pretty wow. cool. That NYPD has it. Yeah, it's yeah. a great system. So you can narrow down where where that that call came from. Yeah, actually, Bill Bratton does some work with Shot Spotter now. And uh, we used to have to do it old school back in the day, like. <laughs> find the guy yeah. like and it, it actually it actually within their advertising is within 10 or 20 feet with a gun shot and this, when it gets good. even better it's a kind of a system that learns itself as it gets better it'll tell you even like shotgun versus pistol oh wow, wow. so it's really wow. really what, what does that system cost it's price i think it's a little pricey but uh you know it's, it's worth it and listen you know one thing even if you have a, a tight budget you can use like you know asset forfeiture money, money you see. You learn how to do that though in the projects anyway. My friend Dante has a joke that he does about how his daughter heard the gunshots. He's and then you know, instead of getting scared and jumping under the bridge, she goes, "Daddy, somebody's shooting an AR-15 outside. They got 15 in the club." <laughs> <laughs> That's his joke. Like yeah, she, yeah. It's time to move, Dante Nero. And shout out to you, buddy. Um, also, too, there was another thing. Oh, the um, we're talking about the. Uh, all right, forget. It. I forgot already. The, no, you know what? I, I could, if I could, just segue into this. There was just a um, a former deputy inspector from the NYPD is now a chief in Vermont, and he was talking about. And I don't know what he's smoking in Vermont. He was talking about cops not shooting a knife wielder. I uh, saw that. Did you see that? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, what? in all fairness, depending on how far away the the the, the the guy with the knife is, you all know during training, you're probably better using your hands than trying to reach for your gun. If you reach for your gun and the guy's less than 10 feet away, you're going to get stabbed the fuck up. No, I, I disagree. I, my gun's coming out if a guy's got a knife. And yeah, but now you only got that one hand. Well, See, I'll I, hold I him off of my left hand and I'm going to light him up with my right hand. I come from a fighting bag. You, know? you come on. No, I'm, 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 I'm not only a, am I taking away the knife, I'm stabbing I you three times. I did six and a half years in anti-crime. I'm, I'm wiping <laughs> the blood off of my, my tongue uh, right uh, now. Uh, <laughs> No, but but did you you saw, saw that? Right? I saw the article. So what are your I, feelings about that? I, if it's if there's enough distance, you can yet, say you agree with him. Tim, okay. Tim, making up be the first time today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think he's making like a blanket statement, which uh, I don't agree with. I know he's a very well educated guy. Remember, he was an NYPD guy. Actually, yeah. he went up went up there to some uh, of the most well educated people, the stupidest motherfuckers well, on this earth. I'm though. not sure oh, if he's easy, that category, easy, but he, easy. no, it's the truth. But uh, he's uh, you know highly educated. Uh, Fellow, uh, are you saying academia has no place in the police? Department? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying. But if he's making a blanket academics. statement like that, he's he's wrong. Well, do you see? A few years ago, they sent a bunch of chiefs from the NYPD to Scotland to study their use of force because they don't carry guns mm -hmm. in Scotland, and that's where a lot of this crap came from. Yeah. And then listen, I think there's somebody in the city council that is saying they're trying to put some legislation out. The New York City City Council saying that we need less cops. Yeah, I saw like, that. Th I've never that's, ever heard any elected well, official say we I need mean, less cops. Yeah. You know, there's a th if you're a conspiracy theorist, like I, I, sometimes I, I tend to fall into that. There's a whole thing that's going on right now between the the prison reform, um, lowering the voting age, um, getting allowing people with with uh, felony convictions to, to vote. vote. It's all, you know, it's it's preparing for, for the future where we're going to have, uh, and who are you going to, who, who gave me this ability to do this all over again? Oh, this party did. So who are you going to vote for? Yeah, it's I all, it's, it ha, it, it's too much of a coincidence. All these things that are pushing us in this one direction, taking away the authority from the police officers, the respect. 
um, going back to basically defending yourselves. What happens to a, a community when all of a sudden there's less police officers, they're less authoritative? Now you're going to have people who are vulnerable again. And who do those vulnerable people have to rely on right now? Their family, or they have to join into a clan of some sort, gangs. or a gang, yeah, or a group. You know, it's funny. I, I did a lot of uh, meetings, community meetings, church basements, school cafeterias, and uh, I'd get a room, you know, full of church ladies a lot of times. And uh, nobody's paying as much attention to the church ladies as they should. Because yeah. church ladies want, they want assertive policing. And nobody's say. paying attention they to want, the church ladies. They want, they want their neighborhoods cleaned up. They want the guys off their corner. They want nobody on their stoop. They don't want to be smoking weed. They don't want uh, yeah, unleashed dogs. Alex, did you All see, that quality of life stuff, they did, want that. Did you see the big fight with in the subway in Brooklyn when the one cop who I wanted my anti-crime team, if I ever went back to anti-crime, hit and knocked the kid out. Mm -hmm. That was beautiful. Yeah. But politicians were criticizing that, and he got transferred the next well, day. We're, we're and, he was, and he was trained in the academy to how to punch. Yeah, so. yeah. With this, yeah, that's that's part of training. You can't, you can't get rid of that. Uh, the, you train that. You box in the police academy. Yeah. But uh, I always keep forgetting what I wanted to talk about. But, um, oh, but we're disregarding one, old people. One troubling uh, thing I see. Senior citizens are completely being disregarded in our, 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 our society right now. It's like they don't have a voice. Yeah. Well, the church you ladies, the, they should spend more once time you talking reach to a certain them. Once you reach a certain age, look at the little thing that they, they throw out right now. Okay, boomer. That's a... Uh, like whenever somebody who's a, of a certain age, a baby boomer, pass, it, it fall into that break. Or they don't like being called millennials, so now they're retaliating by, all right, boomer, relax. Yeah. And they don't want to listen to what old people have to say. They're disregarding their voice. Yep. They yeah. think they're going to be young forever. People, young people always think that, that they're going to live forever, that they're going to be young forever, and they're forgetting their parents, their, their, their grandparents. Well, what, some, of the, some of the heaviest critics of, of the NYPD, for example... Of, of young folks that never lived in what didn't live in this city when it was oh, when it was yeah, really yeah, bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, right. they can jump that. up and down all they want about I don't like this, I don't like that. But they weren't here in the in the mid '80s during the crack wars. Well, so well they Marx, were, Marx told us about comics. You know, three of them got robbed yeah. recently. They're getting a taste of yeah, what they're, New they're, York they're getting to be what's like. called a hot dose. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, I listen now to like the local news stations on the radio, and they'll say like, uh, you know, a knife wielding suspect in Brooklyn, uh, you know, robbed a uh, robbed a bodega. And I'm waiting for like no, more. you don't get and nothing. That's it. Right, that right, used to be right, every day. Right, you right. can't even. You're, you're going to reach a point. You can't even say male or female. No, but that used to be every day. Now, now that's a that's a news event because it doesn't happen that much anymore. Right, exactly. Well, exactly. I tell you what, and I, I'm not one of these pessimists, but when I start hearing that my friends are getting robbed, uh, you know, on a daily basis now. And, uh, you know, that's the sentiment that's, well, you all kind of sort of talk to each other. Like, look, if somebody's walking their dog and they happen to walk their dog three or four, for three or four blocks, take them on a nice walk, the way you want to do for your, the dog that you love. Now, all of a sudden, your walk is refined, the, it's, it's, it's refined to just in front of your house where you could still see your vestibule if you have a doorman, you're lucky enough, or the, you know, the building next door that has a doorman or somebody, there's a lighted, a lit street. Your dog's not getting that walk anymore at night. He might not even go out anymore at night because it's too might dangerous. Be a pattern. This, somebody's targeting comedians. It's it a, could I be. It's a yeah, yeah, yeah. Could be. Maybe they told so, some bad yeah, jokes they, the night before. What are we doing about this? Yeah, it's a, I can see that a Comstat thing. Yeah. And the bite, like we, uh, we yeah, talked you about. definitely could, right? Has anyone been working on this comic Is pattern? Anybody talking to comedians? <laughs> yeah. Have you, have you had a meeting with the comedian it, it's community? Just, it, it just so happens yeah, that Yeah, we got this guy, Mark DeMeo. He, he's Who's detective. the person to call? You know, obviously, they're all going to call me. They're they want to know, you? what yeah. should I do? They want to know, how, how involved should I get? Now, what do you tell this person about the, what's going to happen to them now? You got robbed. You're going to have to... You can, you're probably going to have to go to a grand jury. If they don't take the plea, you're going to have to go to trial. And, you know, listen, the further you get from these horrible events... The, the the less of a memory, and then do you want to recall that again? Do you want to rip the scab off that wound again and, and go through that pain again? And then, you know, it bursts your bubble because all these people live in a bubble. And I always used to joke around when I retired. I said, I want to just live in my bubble, man. I don't want to give a shit about what happens to the rest of the city. I just want to live in my bubble. And everybody's been living in their bubble. And guess what? It's gonna. It, bubbles somebody's burst, gonna the bubbles burst. Somebody's gonna burst yeah. your bubble yeah. pretty yeah. soon, man. It's just a matter of time. Because back in the day, when you came on the job in the late seventies, uh, the late seventies, and uh, the early eighties, man, you had two months of the. They weren't even called. <laughs> they weren't even called robberies anymore. They were called muggings. Yes, yeah. 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 There were so many robberies. They, 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 it's a mugging. 
You use the term yoke to a millennial. He thinks it's the thing around a cow. Yeah. You know, he doesn't know that that's how you got yoked you. up. But got you know, the, victim, yeah. the victims are being ignored. You know, that's one of my points I was making. The, vic- the victims are being ignored, to your point. But also, a, a troubling trend I see across the country, but I'll even you can just localize it, is people are running for district attorney now, and they're not talking about crime, victims, law and order. They all want to be social justice reformers. It's a like there was a reform. debate in Queens, the, the woman who won barely squeaked out against, against a, a public defender, and their, their whole d- debates were about social justice and, and who's going to be kinder to the suspects. Not one word was mentioned about victims, right. victims' rights, right. victims, victims being taken care of, pro- walking them through the process and as victims. And you know, we could segue right into what Mark was talking about before, is that January 1st, comes all, all those new no bail uh, crimes that people are just going to be released from arraignment for. That's going to be so interesting because one of the questions that my friend had for me was, well, I don't know, is it, they're going to know my name they, because they, they stole their credit cards, so they're going to know my name, they're going to know where I live, and all this stuff. And usually you'd say, don't worry about that. That was an yeah. incident. Nobody go, is going to go to your house to look for you. But now, if they're out within a certain couple of hours and they're freaking pissed... That you ratted them out, they might. Who knows? And they might show up. And most of that is is that discovery rule. I mean, the no the no bail thing is going to be horrible. Right. The 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 subway rule. I mean, the uh, discovery rule. When there's crime all over the place, that means in 15 and days. Describe to our audience what discovery is. They don't, they may not know. I'm sorry, discovery is basically all the material that a pros- that that the cops bring to a prosecutor in order to pursue that case. So everything, names, addresses, photos, witness statements, all that stuff now has to be given to the defense within 15 days. So detectives, and Bill knows better than me, detectives have a hard enough time getting witnesses to cooperate. Now, good luck, because within 15 days, that guy's going to know that Bill Cannon at 123 Main Street ratted me out to the cops. He's going to know in 15 days. So that's going to be even more. How about walking through crime scenes? Imagine being the victim of a home invasion, and next thing you know, uh, the defense team with the perp is coming and walking through your your house. Into your home. Yeah, and 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 on, you know, from a police administrator like point of view, yeah. I'm sorry to disturb you. Do you remember this person? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, as 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 somebody who ran a police department now on the budget side, you're gonna have to hire more people to put all this stuff together in 15 days. So you're gonna be taking right. cops off the street or paying overtime and all kinds of stuff like that. So it's gonna be a nightmare. Yeah. I There's don't think no it was well thought of. I really don't. It's being done oh, in other states. They've already well walked it back a bit in some other states where they, they realize it's it's a it's an unsustainable system. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, they're extreme measures. And right now we're moving at that pace. We're moving at an extreme pace because they're trying to take advantage of this moment that they have where, you know, you can get stuff like this done. You know, and don't forget too, the we were living in a time where this doesn't seem so absurd because there was no crime, really, and you can go anywhere you want, really. You know, we're talking back, we're all old enough to remember a time where you didn't go to a certain neighborhood at a certain uh, a certain hour. Do you know what I'm saying? Nobody nobody was going. Uh, we joked around about it, but if you were on the subway and you were going past 96th Street, they'd say, conductor, stop, we got a white boy on the train, he, he forgot to get <laughs> off. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You joke around about that, but that was true. You did not go to certain neighborhoods unless you you were taking a big chance at a certain time of day. Right. You, know you have to I'm ask yourself, why would... Why would elected officials enact stuff like this? And it's like I think it's a, it's part of a maybe a progressive agenda where they think it's like there's they no forget such thing as dead too. People, but the again, general they public the has a short memory. They forget what it was like. They didn't grow up in that. Like time. they have no memory because a lot of these people's the, the, these people that are coming to New York City they didn't experience the crime like you said. They don't remember what it was like yeah, when to go to see, school with gangs comics, constantly. You see comics move into Bed Stuy, right? They're moving all over yeah. the place. They're talking about, yeah, I'm from Astoria. I was like, no, I'm I'm from. I grew up in Astoria. Yeah, you know, Astoria was different. It was not like now. I, now I still go back. I still get, you know, Astoria is one of those places where you drive through and then like you're not even there five minutes. Like, what the fuck are you looking at? Yeah. <laughs> I straighten out your face. Like you can't help it. Drive, you freaking idiot. You know what I'm saying? You're stuck in a drive. <laughs> so it just brings out the anger out of you. I don't know why. And combined with all of what we're talking about, this progressive agenda is that cops are under fire and they're not being backed up by their their bosses. I mean, certainly the feeling in New York City from City Hall is that they, they feel like they're not being supported. That's from day one. I mean, yes. from day one, the current mayor... Whatever name he uses now, uh, the current, current he's changed his name a few times, but the the current mayor 
clearly was not uh, on the side of the cops. I mean, Giuliani, again, probably not a perfect human being. We know that. But Giuliani always said, when in doubt, I'm going to I'm gonna give the cop the benefit of the doubt. Right. That's really all the cop wants. Sure. Like, just know that, listen, mm-hmm. don't, don't judge me right off the bat. Get all the facts. And then, you know, we'll weigh all the options and see now what happens. Now it's the opposite. Now it's the opposite. Now so, it's right off the bat we're going to go against the cop. And the mayor, the mayor has kind of incorporated his wife into it as first lady. She's involved in in all this right. stuff, and and again, you know, they they don't seem to want to get the facts. They they don't seem to be totally on board with the cop. They'll certainly take the police protection that's provided to them, sure. but they don't want to seem to be supportive of the men and women that are pushing a radio car around. That's another funny thing. Like everybody's out here, <laughs> they're globe trotting to fight in private jets to fight uh, go, global global warming, <laughs> <laughs> climate yeah. climate change. Climate change. Yeah. You know, and then this idiot from Coldplay cancels his concert because he doesn't want to fly. And it's like, all right, uh, did you talk to your record company about this? Yeah. yeah. How about the people in your band that aren't going to be right. getting paid? Because the only way that you get paid nowadays, if you're in a band, is through touring. It's not through records because nobody buys them anymore. That's right. How about all those roadies that are union members? Now they're out of work. Oh right? my god! Work. Dude. Can you imagine if uh, people just so it's, stupid? It's not. And I well tried to explain out. to this kid on the, that I that I know the other day. He's like, oh, you know, the world's going to end soon. I'm like, listen, first of all. The world's not going anywhere. We live on a rock, okay? The only thing that's going to happen is we're going to die. The only there's not the, the earth is going to be fine. <laughs> it's going to be fine. The only thing that might not be, you know, there might be a hole in the ozone layer and we can't breathe, so we're going to either go on the ground to find another planet there to live on. There should be a climate change comps that meeting, I think. Uh, that's you know, a good idea. That would help out. It's again. unbelievable, man. Oh man. Al Sharpton will be fine though. I think so. Al Sharpton will be Al fine. Al Sharpton will always be fine. He'll be fine. I want. I gotta talk to him, man, because you know. We'll have him on the show. No, because we we (laughs) could. I would love to talk to him. Yeah, I would love to talk to him about that and how do how how do you get out of these tax problems, man? I love when he said he said (laughs) the most brilliant thing about that. He said, "How could they say I evaded my taxes when I didn't pay any?" (laughs) That made so much sense, and I loved it. Well, I think he dipped in for over a million dollars in his uh, just recently. Yeah, Yeah. he's got some lifestyle, man, and he's not even eating anymore. Where's all this money going? I don't know. He was he was kind of more fun when he was fat. Yeah, I liked was, him better yeah. when he was he fat. Was much better. When he was I think fat. behind the scenes he's a hell of a guy, man. He looks to me because he's everybody likes hanging out with him. It's only when he gets uh, he's an old school guy too. When the cameras come on, that's when the real yeah, that's when the, the TV Al shop that comes on. But when he's not, he's 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 uh, you know palming everybody's hand. Guys, son, son, <laughs> guys, I know have interacted with him. They say he's a lot of laughs. He's got a good sense of humor. I know. It's, Who knows? I know. It's there's a lot of things happening when uh, when the cameras go on. Uh, you know that's that's when it's an it's an act. It's an act. He could be a podcast. He could be. You know, he may be a future guest. I don't know. You think we could match wits with him? Uh, well, well, he'll fit. <laughs> well, give he'll a, fit a, right a hell here. of a try. Yeah, he could fit here now. He couldn't well, fit here years listen, ago. Al Sharpton, if you want to come in here, I promise I won't ask you any questions about the taxes. That's your own business. <laughs> I'm my own business. I'll be a good host, man. We'd love he'll, to have you. He could fit um, right in here. No in the tax. Meantime, no tax. In the meantime, questions. we had the honor and pleasure to have you here today, Ed. That's this was uh, you were. Psh. Thank you guys. You're exactly we what can't we needed say, today. We can't say he was at Adamone's level because Adamone was, but he was great. Well, was great. Adamone was, you know, he was the chief of the department. You were just a deputy chief. That's it. That's it. <laughs> but he was the PC of Yonkers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was the police commissioner of Yonkers. And most people call it Junkers, right? <laughs> Junkers. <laughs> Yeah. He's the PC of Junkers. Thank you very much. <laughs> we when love you, Junkers. When you, when you go to Junkers now, do they still recognize you? Anybody can come in. They do. Yeah, they do. When I pop in, yeah. He's been, on, he's been on TV, you know, the New York One and all of those stations, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. No, but I'm just saying, when you go through Junkers right now, you park your car, you get out. Hey, come in. They're a good guy. Listen, I, <laughs> I'm well received still in Junkers. That's, that's, that's a good feeling, man. They're that's good, good guys. feeling. Good guys. If we ever want to have you come back on, would you come back on again? I would, I would. This That's is relatively cool, painless. Yeah, thank you, thank you. You mean it wasn't fun? It was and just you, painless? And you gave me a heads up about him. So it's okay. You're right on the money, by the way. Uh. <laughs> well, on behalf of Police Off the Cuff, I just want to say thank you so much, Ed, for coming in. Thank for you, For gracing guys. us well, thank you, man. over thank here you. in our, thank you uh, all. A, humble, a new humble abode in, in Tribeca. Now they put the hood back on my head? To yeah, 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 take yeah, you yeah. out of here. And we just kick you out the back door. <laughs> and, uh, Bring on the next guest. <laughs> Bill, any parting words? Again, you know, it's so great. We've met so many great people through doing this podcast, and I include you. You're great, great guy. I mean, I can't believe 1994, you were the XO of the 2-4 yeah. when I worked there. It's like, that's the amazing thing about the police department. 
It's long term shit. You know, like thirty yeah. years yeah, later, and you never that. forget people. You and it's a, it's a fraternity them. that I listen. Nothing against my friends that are accountants and lawyers. They don't have what we have. They're no, not, they fuck don't them. Have nobody's listening. <laughs> Who knows? I didn't even know if I was going to say nobody's listening to an accountant podcast. That's but maybe right. there is. Who knows? Maybe maybe there is. I'm sure it's fascinating. And uh, before we go, just a special thank you to our our engineer here, Rashad. Rashad on the ones and twos. Thank you, Rashad. Thank you, Rashad, <laughs> and to our beautiful. Uh, producer Pam, Pam thank you, Pam Leone. Rashad, start reading that comedy book, all right? So Pam scared the crap out of me. I want a joke next week. They were about to start doing construction work out there again. Pam went out there with her tongue. Get oh the money. <laughs> she scared the hell she out of me. She don't talk like that. It's like we a do. dentist office. They're drilling teeth out there. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> they all ran upstairs. The lady downstairs say we can't work no more. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks a lot, man. Police off the cuff is uh, is over now for today. Thank man. you. Good luck, and, guys. End the tour. Thank you, man. Thanks. What's in the... 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 What's in the...